Good morning, everyone. We have a, a fantastic source opportunity this morning. Uh, there are many, many prominent speakers in the world. Many of them have the opportunity to pass through uh, Florida, but I would like to just give a little more specific connection to our speaker this morning, an uh, individual who's, oh, thank you, that, that would be Ray Newman, maybe, right? Michelle McKesson. Uh, an individual, say, uh, prominent position, you should draw some math in Eretz Israel, but more special plus, he's very familiar with our yeshiva. Learned, I remember the days, my early days in uh, Abbas Chayim, uh, learning in the yeshiva, founded in the yeshiva, but more importantly, I think for us, he got tremendous impact on thousands and thousands and thousands of men and women across the globe. And I was thinking that why are we in yeshiva in the first place? Is it just a way to just spend our days? No. There are many things that we could spend our days busying ourselves with. But ultimately, and we don't remind ourselves of that often enough, everyone's in yeshiva to grow. And we have someone of the caliber that we have today to help us uh, maintain our whole purpose, our whole existence. So we have to give really special attention. I would like to also express an extra, extra curse I told coming into Miami, Merit Israel. It's a, usually a whirlwind. And I had to be a little bit of a nudge to see if I can get through uh, to him and really thank him for taking out of his schedule to come uh, to Yeshiva and to speak to us. So without any further ado, I introduce uh, David Olavsky. <laughs> I was here all the way back when they were in Miami Beach, and, and so they decided that North Miami Beach was much holier. We moved to up here, and uh, who knows, eventually we'll end up in Boca. But uh, <laughs> as we continue heading north, yeah. But uh, it's such a bliss to be here, and I have to tell you what a sacrifice it was for me, because I was in Minneapolis where they were in the middle of the heat spell. It was in the twenties. And uh, I had to give that up to come down here to South Florida, and it's such a sacrifice that I make for my God. But uh, what, a, what a pleasure it is to be here and uh, have the opportunity to speak to everybody. Now, I'll I'll tell you what uh, I'll tell you what uh, was always uh, my approach. Now, it's one of the reasons that I ended up in Chum Tzayim. But uh, for a while, I was in Eretz Yisrael, I was in a different yeshiva. And um, there was a show of nation. His job was there to answer the questions. Uh, Wherever I came over, he got that nervous look that people get when you don't want to talk to somebody, you know, if you want to be someplace else. And uh, one time I said to him, I'm not one of the better guys in the yeshiva. Why do you get nervous when I come by? And he said, Golovsky, you make me nervous because you ask easy questions. Hard questions are easy to answer because hard questions are based on a whole bunch of assumptions once you've already made them, then it's can you work like this and this is the chalais, you know, then, you know then the, he says, but I know why you're here, he said to me. You want to know what these two lines are doing in Tysus. I said, yeah, no one knows what those two lines are doing in Tysus, but you're the only one willing to ask it, because you're sitting here looking at things from a simple point of view. You're a little child who notices that the emperor has no clothes, and it's true. It's the simplest thing. 
Yeah, I was talking once to a group of guys from a small yeshiva in Yerushalayim called the Mir. And uh, they were, I guess it's a worry in Shidduchim. We have no idea what we're doing. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing when we're dating. So, uh, so I said, uh, okay, we want to so I want you to give us a vibe on dating. I said, there are 2,500 people in the Mir Yeshiva, half of them on salary. I'm sure it must be somebody's job. No, there is nobody who, the people need to show bias afterwards, no, tell you this and that. No one teaches you what to do for dating. So I said, so why is it my problem? He says, listen, if my marriage is falling apart, would you make time to see me? I said, probably. He says, so it's more time efficient if you speak to me beforehand. <laughs> I said, you know, that makes sense on some level. So I, I had this whole vibe there, and all these guys here with the notebooks and that. And I started with the first question, trick question. Why should you get married? Now, one guy could give a coherent answer. I mean, they could, but it didn't make any sense. The first guy says, to give. <laughs> he was so proud of himself, he must have read a book. You know what I mean? <laughs> As a way, there's no one to give to in the mirror. You can't learn the other book. You can't clean up the dira. You know, you can't get married again. So the guy says, it's a mitzvah. I said, oh, you have an easy time. First girl you see, hit any room from the room, the guy, hit her, you get the ring, move on, go back to the bed. Yeah. He says, have children. I said, so you're not looking for a girl, you're looking for a piece of DNA. You know what I'm Make sure that strong peasant stock can bear you many strong children. And so finally, one guy told the truth. My mother's making me. I thought that was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy said to me to say, okay, so why should you get married? I said, I just want to point out that it's just dumb luck and they were already dating. I said, just dumb luck you haven't found anybody yet. I said, but do you realize you wouldn't have gotten married and you have no idea why you're getting married? I said, but don't feel bad. Speak to most married people, they don't know either. <laughs> people get married. People get married, people get married. And you can check this out. And everything I say, I always say, check it out. Don't believe anything I say. Go check it out. I was brought up to be a cynic and question everything. Yeah? Um, <laughs> Fill in the yeshiva, whatever yeshiva you want, you know. This guy from Yeshiva X comes upstairs to Shemayim, they say, what did you accomplish in your life? I learned a thousand dollars from Laura, fine, come on in. Next guy comes up, what did you accomplish? I learned two thousand black from Laura, oh, come on in. Right. Yeshiva C, where, where did you go? Oh, uh, two thousand, three thousand black from Laura, oh, come on in. Guy comes from Covet's time. Yeah, what did you accomplish in your life? What do you mean? <laughs> what did you accomplish? I don't know, I question it, I don't even know what you're talking about. What do you mean by accomplish? You have to define terms. I don't know what you mean by accomplish. Yeah. <laughs> How should you learn? Learn? What do you mean? Like, you don't know. You don't grab anything. I really don't know. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they say, okay, so at least say over something. He says, no, it doesn't work that way. You say it over, and I'll slug you up. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a natural fix for me. Because that was my natural personality. I, I, I'm not going to put it So, uh, so, but I always say this, most firm people do what most firm people do, because that's what most firm people do. <laughs> and most people don't ask any questions. Everybody does what they do. Yeah? I once had a number of yeshiva bathroom at uh, my Pesach Seder, and I remember one of them pulled out his first box of notes. I said, this is going to be a long evening. You know what <laughs> so I got, I got to work fast to throw them off. I said, why don't we have a Pesach Seder? You know, not one person is giving me a coherent answer. I shrugged at whatever they said. Well, obviously, they don't come back. But uh, <laughs> well, why do we have a Pesach Seder? At the end of the day, why do we have a Pesach Seder? Nobody knows. I can tell you, I can tell you, you know, five shots and then, holach ma'anya, kuholach ma'anya. They have that gear, sir. You know what I mean? I, uh, but, but why are we doing things on the most basic level? So, uh, so I want to I want to start off with a Rashi, and everybody knows, yeah, famous Rashi, and a famous Rashi is defined by, yeah, one that the person speaking happens to know. That's a famous Rashi. That's when the person tells you the famous Rishonim. There are no famous Rishonim. I know Rishonim. Yeah. So, uh, so this is a famous Rashi. Yeah. It's at the end of Parshas Nami. It says the Yomas Haran al Pnei Terach Odi. He died on his face. Right? So he did die on his face. That was very messy. So Rashi brings two shot in. It says it's a coven playing off of Pnei as either Lifne or Mipne. So Rashi says he died before his father, Lifne. Or he died Mipne. He died because of his father. And he brings in that Yisrael. We all heard his kids. Yeah, we all know the story. We went this as little children. Terach was not just an Ovei Rodezara. He actually made a Rodezara. That's what he did for a living. How's business? Thank God. Right? 
That's what he did. He wanted a God. He went to the heaven of the sun. He made you a God. You want a love God, a basketball God, a money God, whatever you want, a good God. Yeah. So Abraham is looking around the shop and he says, How can he be God? He be God. He can't all be God. So he's out to his wonderful, powerful God. So how does he explain this to his father? So he takes a hammer and he walks to the store and he smashes everybody except one big guy and sticks the hammer in and he waits for his father to come home. He says, Abraham, what did you do? He says, it wasn't me. You should have seen it. It was unbelievable. All the gods started arguing. This one said, I'm the most powerful. I'm the most powerful. And the big guy said, I'll show you. And he picked the hammer and he smashed it. The Turk says, what are you talking about? They don't talk and they don't move. He says, if they don't talk and they don't move, then why do you dive into them? Devastating theological question. What would any responsible parent do if their son asked him a devastating theological question? Take him to the evil king Nimrod. <laughs> they have a of therapy, but the idea is the same. <laughs> and Nimrod says to him, Abraham, why can't you be like everybody else? Just pick a God and worship him. He says, Well, they have a problem. If there's so many gods, I don't know what it is. So Nimrod says, Take my God, he's fire. He says, Why are you afraid of fire? He says, Because fire is ultimate power. It burns and destroys everything, and I love power. So Abraham says, You want power? Then why don't you dive into water? It's so strong, you can put out fire. <laughs> Good one. Thank you. Okay, fine. We're going to switch to the water god. Fire, fire, fist, sun, everybody. Into the water god. He said, What's that? The water is powerful. Yes, he said, Why don't you worship the clouds? So powerful produces the water. Okay, we'll pray to the clouds. Wait a second. We'll pray to the clouds. Pray to the wind. They're so powerful, they can blow the clouds. He says, Okay, kid, I see where you're headed. I'm going back to fire. <laughs> no sense of Right? And he makes a big kitchen at Asian, two people grab Abraham, and he says, let's see if you're all powerful, invisible God, can save you from my God. And they throw him in the kitchen at Asian, and a miracle. He does die. His clothes don't burn, his hair doesn't singe, he's fine. He's trying to come out, he wants to stay here long, and now they're fine. He comes out, now they turn to his brother Haran. <clears throat> says Rashi, Haran had fallen under Abraham's influence. Yeah? And he knew that he was the next step. As they were leading Abraham to the Christian age, they knew they were going to ask him this question. And he said, I'm a believer. He says in his heart, if Abraham comes out of that Christian age alive, I'm going to declare myself for a Kurdish parable. But if he dies, I'm switching sides and going over to Nimrod. Right? So after Abraham comes out, they say to Haran, whose side are you on? And he says, I believe in Abraham, I believe in the God of Abraham, the one God of the monotheist. They throw him to the Christian age and he dies. That's what it means, al Pnei Terah, that's what Rashi says. Now, I'll teach you something that is the most important thing you have to know in the world. Yeah? I speak to students in the finest yeshivas and seminaries and people who had one hour in a reformed temple on a Sunday morning. And no matter who it is, I ask them, what's the most frustrating thing about your Jewish education? And they always say, it's not relevant to my life. I don't feel like it relates to my life. Yeah? I'm sure everybody in this room at one point asked this question. Rebbe, why am I learning this? Why do I need to know this? I don't have an ox, and I'm not planning on buying one. <laughs> I don't run through the streets with pictures. Um, if I marry a woman, it'll be under a chuppah with a ring. I won't give her a piece of silk of indeterminate value. If I divorce her, it'll be based, and I won't throw the get from my roof into her closet. Why am I learning this? Why do I need to know this? Yeah? What the person is saying is, how does this affect my life? People say to me, I don't enjoy God. I said, that's because you don't know what you're saying. They said, no, I have an oscar. So, i Used to, you didn't know what you were saying in Hebrew. Now you don't know what you're saying in English. Oshawa doesn't make it any more meaningful to you. So instead of saying, Lahodel, Sahalel, Shaber, Hofehel, Romain, Lahadel, Rebbe, Halel, Kaleis, you say, You are high, you are mighty, you are exalted, you are extolled, you are uh, uh, very high, extremely mighty, you know, you're extolled. You know what I mean? And uh, it doesn't mean anything. You copy out a list of words. You know what I mean? It doesn't really explain to me. If you don't know what you're saying, it's not going to be meaningful to me, obviously. So the most important thing is relevance. Whatever you're doing, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, Why? Why am I doing it? What's the meaning behind it? Yeah? And people learn things and they don't understand. I was a mashkiach in yeshiva during a particularly dark period of my life. And um, I can relate to this story, having been a mashkiach. They were learning from a town. So the mashkiach put a chair in the doorway uh, to the base of So everybody 
push past it to get to the end. And they're sitting and learning much together in the club, and he says, What are we learning? Which took you a barbarous around. And he says, Do you actually see a barbarous around and he doesn't appear to you to move it? You see it, it's there. I know. What Shiva used to say, it's possible for a guy to sit and learn in Kolo all day and not once think about a good girl. That, that I'm just doing this, it doesn't relate. So everything has to make sense to me. So I look at this Rashi, and this Rashi is trying to tell me something. From today, the 28th year. Yeah? Not, I'm not learning Rashi for insights into a thousand years ago, or the Medrash that he brings for insights into two thousand years ago, or the Pusik for insights into three thousand years ago. Today. It's got to relate to my life. Yeah? That's got to be Taurus Kaya. It's got to be a lot. Yeah? Thank you very much. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so what's he trying to tell me? So the, the, the question is obvious, right? Anyway, you got a question. How can Abraham declares himself for a Kodesh Baruch Hu when he gets an ace, and Haran declares himself for a Kodesh Baruch when he dies? Kodesh is the first guy to die on Shri Shashem. Right? He died because he was in Kodesh Baruch How come he didn't get a miracle? So there are a lot of different answers to this question. But uh, for me, the answer that I got was when I was in the class of internet. It's a very hard class. And, and today I can't even do the class. I was once speaking in a university four years ago, and they said, if you say the word intermarriage, everybody will hear it. Can't even mention it. That's how, that's how dramatic it is, yeah? Uh, so difficult. But back then I was giving a class, and five minutes of the class, and this girl bursts into tears and runs out of the room. And I was shocked, because it usually takes me a half an hour to find like, burst into tears and runs out of the room. So this was a record. So I spoke to her afterwards to see what I said that upset her so I could use it again. And uh, <laughs> she said, no, it's not you, I said, too bad. I said, what is it? Said, well, this is a very emotional topic for me. I said, why? She said, I come from a strong Jewish background. Said, what does that mean? I went to a Muslim synagogue, I had a mitzvah, we used to have a Pesach Seder, you know, um, my mother went to the sisterhood, you know, we used to put the electric veneer in the window of Hanukkah, and I knew I was Jewish and I would never hear that. I go to university, I meet this. Nice time he was trying, I'm dating him, and I fell in love. So I told him, if he converted, marry him. Fine. So he agrees. So we, uh, I moved to his city, we planned the wedding, we set everything up. He starts the course, halfway through, he says, I can't get from here. I said, What? I didn't realize my catalysis would mean so much to me. I didn't realize my mother would be so upset. I can't go from here. So if you want, I'll marry you the way you are. If you want, you can convert to Catholicism. If you're worried about the people being confused, but I can't convert to people. And she looks at me and she says, and I broke up with him. And uh, that was a few weeks ago, and it's very hard for me to hear this topic. So I said, why did you break up with him? Uh, those of you who are considering a career in the abundance, by the way, that's the wrong answer. Yes, you should know. I'm supposed to say, good for you, proud Jew. But <laughs> I told you I wasn't the best guy in the Jew. Anyway, so I said, why did you break up with him? That's because my duty was so important to me. I said, what does that mean? The holidays. I said, you can be intermarried and put a menorah in the window. Yeah, I, I went to one of these gift guides. It's the perfect holiday gift for the, for the intermarried couple, a Jewish star to put on top of the tree. You can be intermarried and have a, a Pesach Seder. There's a Haggadah for the intermarried couple. You know, you want to have a say. I said, you can keep the holidays. So she says to me, I don't know. I said, well, let me ask you a question that we as from Jews have had to ask ourselves many times, twice a day. Yeah, actually five times a day, if you think that. And uh, the whole mouth shook up. What would you do if someone put a gun at your head and says, convert with gun? What would you do? You never heard the question. You thought about it? She said, I would let myself be killed. And I said to her, never. You broke up with the man you love, you prepared to die for something, and you have no idea what it is. And I suddenly realized that maybe that's what Rashi kind of does. Aaron went into that ditch in the age because he believed that there was something important enough to die for. Harun went in for one reason, because Aaron did. And it's just not good enough. And yet, if you ask the average Jew who's still a Jew today, why are you a Jew? Don't think my parents were Jewish. Yeah. And why were they Jewish? Their parents were Jewish. Their parents were Jewish. Their parents were Jewish. Tradition. Tradition. Yeah, that's it. That's all we do. That's what we do. I said, and if you were born Muslim, I'd be Muslim. If you were born Christian, I'd be Christian. 
No, I happen to be uh, from Jew because I was born to Jew. I was speaking at once, I went to a seminary in Israel, and I made this point. I said, if you were born Christian, the Christian born not the gospel, that means that you're just a Jew because of a freak of birth. That doesn't mean you're Jew. And at the end, all the girls came up and they said, well, I'm a from Jew because I was born from Jew. You're right. That's why I did. So let me tell you a worse story. I don't have any good stories. I only have bad stories. <laughs> this guy once said, I want to leave you a positive note, but I don't have one, so I'll give you two negatives instead. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking at an Odin Shabbos in a modern Orthodox community somewhere in the New York area. And uh, all these kids went to very fine Jewish high schools. And she's a high school. Um, we all came from all the different Shabbos and Kosher. And uh, they had an Orthodox shul, which had a youth program. The purpose of the youth program was to keep these kids out of shul. Because otherwise they run around and they make noise, and then the parents get hit on some spot. Uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they don't sit down. And uh, so they get a bunch of teenagers to run the youth program, but they haven't gotten in years anyway. You know what I mean? And, you know, we can't do something for teenagers, so it's like, well, it depends when they have this social get together. You know, um, where uh, everyone just comes to hang out and play night. But, you know, uh, you have to have a speaker for a public program. Nobody wants to listen to a speaker. So you have to get somebody who can speak for like five to six minutes without boring everybody to tears. And uh, then leave them, everybody just hang out. Right? So, you know, it becomes a, a search. I'm a doctor doing research with disgusting disease. Always fun to You know what I mean? Uh, look at the fungus in this guy's mouth. Yeah, pass that around. Look at that leg blew up. Is that disgusting? Yeah, he brought an actual hand. Yeah, pass it. <laughs> Don't bring a lawyer speaking about some case in the news that nobody cares about, but you'll pretend to listen to it. I'd ask him for a job one day. You know what I mean? So bring a local business leader to speak about business ethics and other oxymorons. But, um, <laughs> like military intelligence. But anyway, <laughs> but now it's, uh, you know, it's Marx, they burn through most people in the community. They brought some guy to speak about his recent trip to Romania. Always a crowd pleaser. The synagogues in Bucharest have like a Muslim influence, you know, like domes, like, like a Muslim influence. <laughs> Make it stop! Make it stop! <laughs> the youth director sees me. He knows he can't pull this off. He's got to get somebody. He says to me, you owe me a favor. I said, yeah. I want you to be the sacrificial speaker of the young. <laughs> I said, I'd rather give you a kidney. I said, I don't need your kidney. I said, nobody wants to listen to me. He goes, you're right. Just five, six minutes. Don't bore the kid to do this fast. I said, okay. Confrontation's always fine. Do you like to argue? I said to a teenager, a teenager's like to argue. He said, no, they don't. So, uh, <laughs> I walked in the room and I said, okay, I'm going to put two buttons in front of you. Put two buttons on your left, and you'll wake up tomorrow morning, a nice kid in a nice family, same socioeconomic strata, but you were never Jewish. You said he was never Jewish. Push the button on the right, and you'll say the way you want. I said, my guess is if I want to run out to your high school and I made this offer, 60 to 70 percent of the kids would push the button on the left and choose not to be Jewish. Confrontation. You just looked at me. I said, what? Wow. He's proud like, how can you talk to us like that? Everybody would push the button on the left. <laughs> so it's Friday night, and I'm in a little room full of Yeshiva kids who all want to be Christian. And uh, I said, why is that? Now that's not fair because I'm asking, you know, high school kids to think, which is not what we train you to think. Yeah? High school is not about thinking. High school is listening and repeating what we say, preferably in the same exact words. Right? That's where you get credit. You know this. This was a process. You had to learn this. This started in the fourth grade when Mora, you know, whatever her name was. You know, I'm going to 50 years old, walked into the room. Those notes are crumbling as you're holding them. She learned Kumish and Rashi with Rashi. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> okay, what's the most important mitzvah in the Torah? Shabbos? Very good. Looking for something else? Uh, Tatris? Very good. Something else? Pesed? Oh, getting closer. So, one bright kid figures out, oh, she doesn't hear what I think. We're supposed to guess what she wrote in her notes. This is Pashas Mayer. Yossi, this Oracle? Excellent. What's your name? Yossi? That's right there. Yossi. And uh, where do we find it best illustrated? Uh, yes, Yossi? Uh, the story of Adam and the Malachas. Excellent. Yeah? And so by the time you're in high school, you know nobody cares what you think. 
Don't ever give me opinion. Oh, you'll know this when you go for your interview in Israel. I'm looking for a place where I can grow. <laughs> Every person says the same thing in my mind. It sounds better than I'm looking for the place with the latest garden. <laughs> Easy access to town. Anyway, so. So I say to them, I say, okay, so none of you want to be Jewish. Why is that? So they all look at me. What do they want to say? I said, well, maybe these of you. You hate being Jewish. You can't say that. It's true, but you can't say it. So one girl says, is that true? I love being Jewish. Shabbos is the only day I get to sleep. <laughs> that says it all right there. <laughs> Once it's not a yeshiva guy trying to do hear it, explain the uh, yeshiva girl, trying to do hear it, explaining the perfect Shabbos, you know. Says, so you wait for your head to come on the shore. You pause the thing at the table, read the paper, you know, and in the winter you could be in bed by like 7 30. Yeah. Oh, it's great. You, know, you just lie there. It's like being dead, you know. You're not used to sleeping that much. You get up at like 4 o'clock in the morning, you go to the kitchen, make some snack, read the paper, go back to bed, get up late, you know, catch the end of goblin, come home, you have lunch, you get another uh, nap. Before you know it, it's over. What a spiritual odyssey! <laughs> Where most people keep Shabbos is indistinguishable from being in a coma. <laughs> don't judge me once. I don't enjoy keeping Shabbos. I said, try staying awake. See how it does. <laughs> Might be a different experience. Yeah. Says I love. I love being Jewish. Sometimes I get to sleep. I said, you know what? Non-Jews turn off their phone and take a nap. She was devastated. I said, what is it you like about this? Wait, I know, because there's so many things you can't eat. No, no, I know, because there's so many things you can't do on Saturday. No, I know, because you really love learning crisis. No, I know, and they're like, you're a real idiot. I said, then why do you do it? Listen to the answer, because there was a half a million dollars invested in this Jewish education. My parents make me. Why? Their parents make them, and their parents make them, and their parents make them. Tradition! And I suddenly realized that whether I was speaking to people who came from the future, Best Jewish education, or who had a hour, you know, was wrestling with any matters. And I asked, why are you a Jew? The answer is, because. Because, because I was born Jew. And I was born Christian, I think Christian, I was born Muslim, I was born So I look at my watch, I'm pushing on eight minutes now, I know I gotta get out of here, because you know, I'm pushing, pushing the limits. And I said, okay, they said, wait a second, we know the rules, you can challenge us. But at the end, you have to leave us with some kind of answer so we forget we've ever seen you. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you left them in the you know? I said, well, you guys will have a quality Jewish education. Think for a second. Why do you have to be a firm Jew? So the guy says, I know why. Otherwise, the Kodesh Baruch Hu will burn you in Gehenna forever. <laughs> now, there was the first positive thought I've ever heard. <laughs> I was speaking to a guy who was in one of these yeshivas for the religiously and uh, emotionally challenged in this job. And in the second year, so he was more or less sober. And I said, uh, <laughs> what you got? You know, you go to old Abba. So what's that like? You know, it's a beach. <laughs> Cold beer, continue developing the picture, I'm sure you can figure out for yourself while well, been living in South Florida. Yeah? Suffice it to say it was closer to the Muslim conception of heaven than the Jewish. <laughs> 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 I know we did a half a minute for that to move around the room. But anyway, I said, is that what you think of Omaha is? He says, no, I wish. <laughs> I said, so what is it really? He says, you sit on the cloud and you play a harp. <laughs> I said, do you like music? He said, not particularly. I said, so what are you going to do? He said, I'll get an electric car. <laughs> Put my halo on sideways. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. He said, you get on the hop of your bed, and I said, it burns you and get in them forever. I said, that makes sense to you? He said, that's what I always heard. I said, you know, that's like what the father says to his daughter. You know, your room is a mess. If you clean it up, I'll buy you a new outfit and take you out for dinner. Now, you know, I'll break your arm and beat the deal blood. <laughs> this what you do. Because I call social services. <laughs> I said, well, that's it. You could check out the bar, You know, I just come to your father who I have it. Oh, come on. This doesn't come from no place. You must have heard this on some level at some point. I was in Yeshiva once, and I fell into a funk. It was one of those long winters by there were two others, I don't know, that year I think there were three others, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, went on we were doing your bumpers, the Gemara that never ends, you know what I mean? The Zman that never ends. And so like, you start to, you know, get sick. 
Except I have my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why he didn't show up in the forecast. He's <laughs> dead. In musty pajamas, plates, and taffy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I remember he came in to give me, he's done, he's done, get up here, get going. And I said, Rebbe, what's the point? I'm just going to go to Gehenna anyway. <laughs> and he said, that's true. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was down, and he wanted to cheer me up. So he says, focus on the following. At 350 degrees, you bake, but at 400, you burn. At 400, I feel bad. <laughs> then I got my job in three times a day, and I learned that I did all the mitzvahs at the end, I would only bake. <laughs> and this, unfortunately, the second day comes to us. That's that joyous time of time. We all love that time of day. You get there, when I was a little kid, I thought it was really short. Sit there with the matzah, counting the pages. 800 pages, I'm living in Mecca. <laughs> One point I realized half of them were in <laughs> only 400 pages. We'll be out of here in no time. <laughs> Let me see, the Chazim just spent 15 minutes on this word. I don't think we're going home for time. <laughs> but anyway, was that if you stay in Shul long enough, you know, and listen to the Chazim, so that God knows how bad you are, you forget what you're saying. <laughs> you don't have to go to hell, you've already been there. You know what I'm saying? But then you get old and you start following along, and then it gets much worse. Because everyone knows them. Okay. <laughs> oh, moose. Now there was a subtle message there. <laughs> <laughs> we picked it up. Someone might live, but you're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> Why die, 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 die? I remember when the teenager was like, "Who's gonna die?" <laughs> Wait, wait, now you get to pick the way you're going to go. Move by fire, move by water, fire. Kind of hot, I probably drink water for a while. You know? Move by sword, move by storm. I live in South Florida, I think I'll go with sword. Move by earthquake, and move by pestilence. I don't know, what is pestilence? We'll take the pestilence, Bob. <laughs>
that you'll burn in Gehenna. I don't believe in Gehenna, that you'll really burn in Gehenna. <laughs> 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 I'll bury myself in asbestos, don't worry about it. I'll save my money and invest in sorry Genix, I'll freeze me. You know what I'm saying? Nothing's gonna happen to me. So why are we doing this? You know and if people don't know why they're doing this, this is the problem. Well, the American humorist Mark Twain said, when all else fails, try the truth. So I'd like to pay the truth. Yeah? Why a person is supposed to be a person at all? I am quoting from the Social Charm, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. How many people have liked the Social Charm? Excellent. How many of you have finished the Social Charm? Put hands go down. <laughs> it is one of the most impossible smart to read because of the English translation. If you have the old translation, you have words like watchfulness and zeal. Nobody uses it. That's the new translation. It has words like alacrity and vigilance. Words that nobody uses in real life. The only person who ever used the word vigilance was Mad Eye Moody, and it wasn't even him, it was Whitey Crab. Anyway, <laughs> let's see the two kids and pretend they don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so, so, uh, so people don't understand what it's saying. It's so hard to understand. I want to just do the first two lines of the social science. <laughs> Which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. I just want to explain it. Is the answer to this question? No. She said, I've seen this research, I'm going to me. She's more reasonable than other Marco Russo. The root and the foundation of everything in this world, all religiosity, all Christianity, everything, is to answer the question Marco Russo, why are you alive? Such a simple question, so hard to answer. Yeah? I was talking to a group of guys in their 20s about marriage, and I said, you know, before you get married, you have to know what your goals in life are. You have to define them. Before you get married, you're then marrying somebody, and you have different goals in life. Does anyone yet know what their goals in life are? Okay, raise your hand. I do. I'm going to be a dad. I said, that's not your goal in life. He says, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, I'm in dental school. I said, I'll prove it to you. He says, go ahead. I said, you're 90, 100 years old. You're on your death. They're going to write your eulogy. You get to listen in. He was a dentist. He filled many cavities. <laughs> he removed many intact teeth. He was especially good with molars. The guy said, stop. I said, no, I'm getting the best part. Your tombstone is a big tooth. <laughs> he says, lies a dentist. So he says, no, you misunderstood. I meant I planned on supporting myself through dentistry. I said, that's not the goal of life. No. So what is? I said, I have no idea. Because whenever I said anyone I want to be a dentist, everyone said good for you because that's the recipe for a successful life. Yeah? <laughs> Go to university, learn a profession, get a job, buy a house, get married, have kids, happy life. Now you're 40, 45, you have everything. What do you do now? Yeah? Get old and die. We're done with you. Some people figure out they can play twice. They get another wife, another house, another job. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't. Most people are content just to have you know, a, uh, a midlife crisis. Have you ever seen these people? <laughs> I'm thinking about the gray ponytail people out on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> They're barely alive. Barely alive. They give themselves a sports club and they can't get into it because they're not so flexible. <laughs> Never just goes, Harry's having a good life crisis. <laughs> Harry gives it up, he comes home, he just gets old. So he's wearing his pants up there. He gets the orthopedic sneakers, takes two minutes to sit down. He falls asleep all the time. He watches the TV, reads the paper, in the middle of a conversation. He's always falling asleep and he always denies it. Oh, I wish I could sleep. I'm up all night. <laughs> there he's going to be sleeping and he always denies it. He just sleeps all the time. That's it. That's his whole life. He's going to sleep till he dies. Or till he gets into his 80s. Then you reach the ultimate status symbol, which is comparing medications with other elderly people. <laughs> like this, I get these two. How much? 20? I take 60. I'm sick of it The more medical science struggles to keep me alive, the more inherently valuable I am. <laughs> and that's it. So, so why am I in this world? Not the possible love, but why am I alive? Here's the answer, says the social show. Yeah? Because Baruch because I told us Hashem was created for one reason. With his Anayah Hashem, and I see the Shina, so she had pleasure from Hashem and enjoyed the light of Shina. He said, Hakaini got me, he got me in a gadu, because this is the truest pleasure and the greatest delight. We call it a Jewish family. What a pleasure. 
I read this to a group of yeshiva guys. I said, what did he say? Why are we alive? They said, to serve God. Nope, don't be saying that. Yeah? Uh, it says, Pleasure from the Shem and enjoy the divine life. Why are we alive? Someone says, to get the divine life. I said, wrong. I thought I read the word divine life. Right, now listen to the entire sentence. I know it's done. But that mind is someplace else. Yeah? Because this is the greatest possible point. I'll say the following. You know, I was created for X, because X is the greatest possible pleasure. But if Y was the greatest pleasure, Z was the greatest pleasure, that's what we were created. Hashem made us for one reason, to get the title God, meet me without even a devil. You're in this world for one thing, to get the greatest possible pleasure. Not to serve Hashem. Don't worry. He's fine. He's infinite. In scientific terms, that's very big. He has everything. He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He's, he's all-knowing. He doesn't need you to do anything. He's okay. Wakes up in the morning, looks in the mirror, sees nothing. He's fine. He's very high self-esteem. You know? So don't worry. Don't have to die. I'm like, okay, Hashem, hope you're feeling better. You're really powerful. You're great. Okay, I'll, I'll catch you by the middle. Don't bring any floods. All right? You're okay? You're cool. Yeah. Hope you're feeling better. <laughs> don't worry. He's fine. He doesn't need you to dive in. He doesn't need you to eat a matzah. He doesn't get a thrill out of bringing the crunch. You know what I mean? He's okay. He's really, he's, he's all about. He created the world for one reason for you. To get the greatest possible pleasure. Great. What am I doing wasting my time in class? Why aren't I out fulfilling my purpose? Ah, there's always a catch. You weren't created to get a pleasure, you were created to get the greatest possible pleasure. Because you cannot have it all. Take something simple. Simple for a non-Jew, and so difficult for a Jew. A buffet. Go ahead and don't get it. They walk over, take a plate of food, and sit down. And a Jew looks at that buffet as a challenge. He says, I could eat all that food. <laughs> I guess physically can't. So those eat the most of the most expensive food. Okay? So you walk around it. No Jew takes a plate of food, walks around it. Playing it out like a little turkey. Trying to figure out that I can get that out of that Yeah, you remember that? And then they start collecting plates. And they start to expand like the incredible Hulk. <laughs> when you can't eat anything, then you won. But even then, you can't eat it all, you have to make choices. And choices get harder. I live in that itself. And then I mean, you meet these people who travel around. You just have to travel around. Wonderful place to place. Yeah? So maybe that's a great pleasure. But you'll never know what it's like to be part of the community. Maybe that's better. Maybe people who flip from relationship to relationship. Or maybe being married for 50 years is better. You can't have it all. I see these people who are workaholics. They have no time to have a relationship with their kids. Maybe it would be better to work less and have more time with your kids. Because you can't have it all. You've got to make choices. Choices between pleasures. None of these things are bad. Everything is good. But you have to make the choice because you can't have it all. You have to decide what's the best. Because nobody wants okay. There used to be a game show called uh, uh, Let's Make a Deal. There were three doors. You get to pick a door. You know, you pick one of the doors. Monty Hall, Jewish kid from uh, from Canada, would say, I'll give you a thousand dollars to switch the door. But counts the money into your money. No. Give you two thousand dollars. Give you two thousand in your hand to change the door. No. Okay. I see what was behind door number one. A Caribbean vacation. Ooh. What was behind door number two? You know, a new car. Ah. What was behind door number three? A year's supply of toilet paper. Now, it's free. You didn't pay for it. All you have is car for it down to the studio. So how can you want to kill yourself? Because if you know I got something, but I could have gotten something better, it gets you crazy. You know that when you go out to a restaurant and you order something on the menu and you see somebody put what else. Oh, I didn't know they had that. Can I, can I switch this? I didn't know. You know, this comes with a sparkler. <laughs> no idea. You know, it's not on the menu. <laughs> no, I don't want to eat it. Please don't eat it. <laughs> a Chinese restaurant, you order something, you're like, dum 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 It's like boiled lettuce, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, when something's on fire, the dancing with the sword. <laughs> no, <I don't> <laughs> because you want the best. The goal in life is not to have a pleasure, the goal is to have the best pleasure. You can't have it all. So what's the best question? What's the best question? 
for sure, the best player is infinite play. He plays infinite, he gets better and better and better and better and better, and never runs out. You have no idea what that means. You can't even imagine. Because to us, what's a pleasure? Pretzels. <laughs> Honestly, how many pretzels can you eat when you're still in Jordan? Three, maybe four, when your teeth get covered with chewed up pretzel gunk, because everything tastes the same. Someone has this love and hate relationship with pretzels, like, oh, get this away from me, and then they talk back. They tell me that tastes better, and they never do. <laughs> but imagine a bag of pretzels that never ran out, and you never got full, and you live forever, and there's no pretzel gunk, and each pretzel tastes better than the one before. <laughs> That's an infinite pleasure. It just gets better and better and better and never runs out. Yeah? An infinite pleasure can only come from one place. Somebody is infinite. Therefore, you know why Hashem put you in this world? It is Anik al Hashem because that is the greatest positive pleasure. You know what I mean? It's better than, you know, going to the beach. It's better than, 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 than having a great meal. It's better. It's infinite. It just gets better and better and better and better. It's the only reason we're in this world. Because God will put us in there to give us this great pleasure because he loves us. And that's what he wants. He wants us to have this unbelievable of this under our shame. The only reason we're here is Yeah? But people don't know that. Because we spend our time doing mitzvahs. We don't know why we're doing this. We just do that. Now we shake a lula, now we eat a matz, now we put a coin in, da 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 We don't know why. I was on a plane with a middle-aged Israeli businessman on his way to India to join his wife, who was earlier in the ashram, they were learning Buddhism and meditation. And I said to him, why? He said, you reach a point in your life where the physical pleasure is not enough, you want spirituality. I said, well, have you ever considered Judaism? He laughed. What does Judaism have to do with spirituality? Judaism is about doing mitzvah. No, no spirituality in it. No ruchmias in it. Yeah. A guy went to the, uh, you know, the Eastern Master um, and uh, the Dalai Lama. And he asked him for a mantra. And the Dalai Lama said to him, You're Jewish, right? He said, Yeah. He said, You already have a mantra. He said, No, I don't. He said, They didn't teach it to you as a child. So says the Dalai Lama, Move into your meditative state, etc., and I'll tell you a Jewish mantra. You ready? Shema Yisrael, Hashem, what can you love? And I thought, You sure you never heard it? Sure, but nobody ever told me that I could daven and it's going to be a spiritual experience looking out of the world. Even though Gemara and Bracha says the Hasidah Rishon used to spend an hour before Tzvila preparing themselves, Tzvila and Shlom an hour saying Tzvila, then an hour coming down from the experience. After they daven, they were so far out of this world, it took a whole hour to come back down. That's what all the mitzvahs are for. Yeah? Why, do we, why do we keep kosher? I always love this when I ask this to, to secular audiences. Why do we keep kosher? For health and hygiene. I mean, you and I are eating in different kosher restaurants, that's for sure. <laughs> the ones that I go to, there's a lot of stuff going on, but it ain't health and hygiene. <laughs> I said, the Chazal tell us that if you eat trade, this tintum halei, you will be closed off the roof. <coughs> I tell you. I have a friend of mine who's an armchair Kabbalist. Yeah? No, he, he dabbles. So when he speaks to a group of beginners, at the end, he does his party tricks. He goes around the room and tells everyone who keeps kosher and who doesn't, and he's always right. How do you know? He says, I threw in one advanced idea that these people didn't get because they don't keep kosher. You did because you didn't. You eat kosher, it opens you up to rochmiyas. Oh, why do we keep shops? Because every week or a day, Kodesh Baruch fills the world with Kedusha and we get tapped into that Kedusha. We, we, the famous story of Ivan Kudla, you know? Ivan Kudla, somebody was, was helping him raise money. And he comes up at night and he sits down with a newspaper. So the Aaron says to him, why don't you learn? He said, don't worry, Rabbi, I have my own haba. I'm working with you. He said, your own haba? What about your own haza? What is your own haza? Yeah, how do you enjoy learning? You don't enjoy the pleasure of it? When a person learns, it's supposed to lift us up out of this world? I'm going to, I'm going to just, I just spoke in another high school somewhere in the country recently. And um, I had a number of friends who came to meet with me. A person said, I don't enjoy learning. I said, can you make a money? You open up any Gemara and learn it, he says, you can't get through that. You have to be able to open the Gemara and, and know what it says. You have to be able to read it and translate it. If you can't do that, then, then turn it into a closed book to you for the rest of life. That has to be your priority. You have to be able to make a learning. And you reach a certain point where if you didn't pick it up, you have to bluff your way through it. And the guy's learning in the basement just for years, so he's bluffing your way through it. 
So I don't learn that. Plus, I collect learning disabilities like other people who collect stamps. You know, I have dyslexia, and I have ADD, and I have a, a focusing problem, and I have retentive problem, whatever. So I look at these tomorrow, the whole thing is out of, out of focus. And I had to work very hard to get into focus. And then I started reading it, and I couldn't figure it out because I was reading it backwards, you know, because I have dyslexia. You know what I mean? And then I would kill myself to get to the bottom of the subject, and then I forgot what I wanted to get to my retentive problem. I would start over again, you know? So, you know, so it was very hard. But if you tell me it over, I can tell me it's as far as I have a problem. Right? It wasn't hard to think it through. But, but, to, but to get it down, and I had to sit down and kill myself to get it down. Otherwise, it's closed book for the rest of your life. You know? So, it, but if you can enjoy learning, you can enjoy learning. The elders of Calum was learning, and the, Russian, the Russians came to take him away. They broke down his the door, and they put their guns on him, and he's sitting there He doesn't even know he's in there. And after a while, they couldn't believe it. And off they left. And he finished, he finished learning. He looked at his wife and said, what happened to his door? He was so good at learning. Yeah? They tell a story. I never checked it out. I'm not pissed off. You know? I spoke to three people, and I uh, found a copy of that. I tell this story. I have no idea. I hear something I tell them. But uh, <laughs> Scheinberg was going in for some dental work, and he couldn't, he couldn't get anesthesia for whatever reason. And so he says, just give me a few minutes to get into a subject and everybody else to you know, they got into a again, he's learning, and they did all the drilling and all of that, and it didn't bother you know? If you learn how to learn, it's what a great thing. But the reason we learn is because of the unbelievable pleasure that comes from it. And that's why we keep shopping, that's why we eat coach, and that's why we do everything. It's just for us to get this unbelievable pleasure of being close to that. And since most people don't even know that that's the goal, that's why they don't look for it. And so they do their mitzvahs, and they go through their day, and they do their stuff, and they wait till they're done so they can play on their phone, or play on their computer, you know, or play Fortnite, or whatever it is that they're doing now. You know what I mean? Until they kill themselves. Like Fortnite kill themselves. I don't know why. Somebody just told me that recently. Um, you know, or, you know, like, this, this, this girl told her friend, she says, uh, she says, I haven't seen you. I, there's, I went off on Facebook, I went off on Twitter, I went off on Instagram, I went off everything. What do you, what do you do? So what do you mean? Now I have a life. Can I use it as a candy crush? <laughs> but, uh, you know, people. What, what, what is everything for? But nobody knows. If you could understand, and you could feel a good girl in your life, if you could lift yourself up out of this world, out of this world. I went to England, and uh, anyone who's been to England will appreciate this. Yeah, it's cloudy and rainy most of the time. Yeah? So this fellow tells me he goes to England, he goes beneath the clouds, and it's dreary and rainy and cloudy the whole time. And a week later, he takes off, he gets above the clouds, and the sky is blue and the sun is shining. I said, the sky was always blue and the sun was always shining, you just didn't know how to get above the clouds. But if you know how to get above the clouds, then you live your life in the sunshine instead of in the, in the dreary darkness. Yeah? Not about a shem, but a hammer is always you know, to get that light, to get that brilliance. On the side, you have a tremendous advantage over easily 90% of the Jews in the world, maybe higher. You have a chance to sit and learn the Jews. You don't appreciate it, probably, most of you, because I didn't appreciate it, most of you don't appreciate it. You, know, you wonder what's out there. That's where you. I'll tell you nothing. You know, I used to teach uh, in the fellowship for the nation I had this guy say to me, Rabbi, you're the biggest challenge for my second and second. I said, really? Which plan did I give? He says, no, I don't listen to you talk. But uh, I know I'm living the secular lifestyle, and I can do whatever I want, and I do. And I know you're living this restricted lifestyle, and I can't help but feel that you're having more fun in life than I do. And I said, he kills you, doesn't he? Right, I'm Jews at the party. Because <laughs> we've got, we got something that's out of this world. What someone once described as the half smile that plays on the lips of the Yom Tovah. When they're here, but they're someplace else. They're above everything else. They're in the light when they're in the darkness. My friends, all I can say is we don't appreciate this so much today because we don't see it. That's what we have to start with.
because when they surrounded Yerushalayim, what they did was try to try to shrink us and limit our ability to affect the world. Yeah, when they translated the the Torah into Greek, it says uh, it says in some uh, Sefer, it was as bad as the day the Luchos were broken because the new Luchos weren't made by Hashem and they couldn't hold it all. And another language came to the Torah. Now people read it, they take another Torah, they know they're not even reading it. They don't appreciate it. So. If, if, if we can move beyond it, break beyond the boundaries, and figure out how to incorporate a great part of everything we do, and then Hashem will be able to live in the light and not in the darkness. And Hashem. I want to leave with one last thought. Um, they asked Rechaim Belashi, what age do you start educating your children? He said 20 years before they were. You know, we live in difficult times. When your kids come here and say, why should I be a Jew? Unless you can show them that you have something better than everybody else out there, they have world out there. There's no problem now. But you can show them there's something better, and then you know that they need some kid to run inside of a kid and make sure it's better than what's out there because you've shown them the rookness in it, not just the, the ritual, but the rookness. The Greeks, they didn't want to be kept in this. The Soka, the Shekalula, the Matzah, don't learn Torah. Because if we find meaning in it and understand it and look for this, then we don't stand a chance. But if we strip that away, we take away the Torah, there's nothing. Ms. Hashem, you'll be able to find that greatness in yourself to be able to pass it on to your children and your grandchildren. And they ask you a question why am I a Torah? You'll be able to give it. It's very, very simple.